We're back. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. More specifically, this is our show on View from the North, an award-winning show, top of the line this past week. How do you like that? And we're asking, how does the social safety net work in Canada? Does it work the same or better as the social safety net works in the U.S.? And for this discussion, Dr. Ken Rogers, retired uh, Canadian businessman in Kelowna, British Columbia. Welcome to the show, Ken. Hello, Jay. I don't think the uh, social net in Canada works uh, as well as th those in the Scandinavian countries, but it does work better than than in the U.S., particularly if you take the, you know, how would you measure a social safety net, you know, or what is it all about? And and I like to think that that a nation uh, it's civilized, how civilized it is can be measured in terms of how they look after their poorest members. Um, you know, and I think, um, you know, Canadians generally believe that the, so, the social safety net is far better than that in the U.S. I think that's an exaggeration. But uh, really, our social safety net, uh, you know, 20 years ago, uh, what could be measured as more successful than it is today mm -hmm. you know many of the many of the features have just like time has changed the circumstances the laws and the rules of what worked uh, 25 years ago we're really dealing with a different society um, you know and and you know the failure of the social net uh, safety net is is in particular obvious in terms of of you know how many food banks do, do we have and how many street people do we have well that's not looking after the poorest members you know certainly nobody would have projected uh, you know 20 years ago that we'd have the ridiculous drug crisis that we have now which has greatly affected everything to do with the those people on the margin now, uh, you know, the most glaring ones, you know, the street people, uh, you know, the drug problems, uh, you know, and all of the major cities in Canada and the U.S. are suffering from that problem. Well, and I was going to ask you, and I think you've at least in part answered it, is um, the, the social safety net is directed at people who are vulnerable, disadvantaged poverty-stricken, homeless, things. The society, as you put it, doesn't work for them. And it strikes me that although, you know, I don't, I wasn't watching it as closely as I am now, but it strikes me that over the past two or three decades, uh, the number of people, the percentage of the population that is vulnerable, that is in need of a social safety net, has dramatically increased in this country. And I, I, I hear you saying that it is also increased in Canada. Yes, <laughs> quite significantly. <laughs> you know, some cities are, are far worse than others. Uh, uh, you know, for example, um, you know, Vancouver in British Columbia has, has really, you know, suffered because it's got such wonderful weather f compared to the rest of Canada that, uh, you know, it's a good place for people who are homeless to go. You know, it's, you know, some cities in Canada, such as Edmonton or Winnipeg, uh, you know, large cities, but, uh, you know, in the middle of February, you know, it can be, you know, 40 degrees below zero, uh, you know, sometimes. And, and uh, even though that's not the norm, it certainly happens almost every winter, and and uh, you know you can't live outside in that weather for long. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, but there are so many challenges for people who don't have any money, uh, who may be disabled because of drugs or health, and uh, you know it seems to me that um, there are more of them now. But the next question I want to ask you is why. Why are there more of them now? What has happened to our society, our respective societies, yours in Canada, ours in the United States? Why has that happened? What factors are in play? You're an economist. You're a business guy. What's the answer? 
You mean, why are there more street people? Why are there more people who need a social safety net? Well, in Canada, I'm not too sure you can measure measure it that way. You know, that, that our, some of our social safety net features work really, really well. Uh, for example, our national Medicare program, you know, is just really slick. Uh, uh, you know, you don't have to pay diddly squat for almost any medical uh, situation. Now, you know, one of the problems with that is, is you know, a, a way to describe it economically is the the federal government and the provincial governments add a ton of of civil servants and they collect a bunch of money from almost everybody it goes into the civil service sticky tube goes around a couple of times less money comes out you know because of the cost of the civil servant and it goes to almost everybody well that's just you know, not economically sensible. You know, you, you should say, you know, who needs it more than the next person? And you should collect less and not have it go around as big a sticky tube and come out more. Uh, like the Scandinavian countries, uh, you know, you know, pick whether you pick Denmark, Sweden, or Finland, you know, they have a heck of a lot less going for them in Can than Canada does. Norway has an advantage if they have, you know, uh, you know, more oil per capita than Canada does. You know, but, you know, that oil has made Norway's standard of living, you know, be close to the top in the whole world. Um, certainly more better than the United States. All of those countries standard of living or the income per capita or what they can how much they get for a day's work is superior to the united states they didn't used to be now canada has gone backwards in that direction way more than the u.s you know it is when i was you know in high school and starting college you know, the standard of living in Canada and the United States were fairly equal. You know, in the currencies, uh, you know, the, the Canadian dollar was generally worth roughly the same as the U.S. dollar. Um, you know, we had one election in which it was basically lost because the Canadian dollar fell to 92 cents U.S. Well, now it's about 72 cents. Uh, and and so you really have the the inefficiency of the of implementing the social safety net is really the key difference between the Scandinavian countries and in Canada. Um, you know, I think the U.S. is worse than Canada in terms of social safety net. How do you look after your uh, you know weakest people, or how do you discriminate against people? I mean. This week, one could even say that, uh, you know, uh, you know, the United States doesn't treat women as equal. Well, you know, the, the... It, it, you know, it strikes me, gee, it's funny, this connection, but I think of all the stories about people in black neighborhoods who get shot. There was a story yesterday about that. And, uh, and what, what the surviving family said, this, the the shooting, the death of this person who was the leader of the family destroys the family. And it's not only an emotional thing, it's an economic thing. So when you allow guns and when you tolerate mass shootings, you're also tolerating an enormous number of what, what do you want to call it? Secondary victims, the beneficiaries of the killing. Um, all lose their position economically, and they're more likely to lose their home, uh, lose their, you know, the economic stability. And so this country doesn't care, I would say, these days, especially as a, uh, you know, a, a function of Trump's approach in his administration. This country doesn't care about people. The, the guys in Congress don't care what happens in the ghettos. They don't care what happened to the poor people. They talk about uh, knocking off Social Security. Oh, my God. 
you know, people contributed, as you mentioned, you contribute to the retirement fund all your life comes out of your paycheck all your life. And then when you finally reach retirement age, Congress talks about, you know, stopping the program or reducing the program. That's really hideous. And it reflects, um, you know, non-caring on the part of the government. So, you know, it's, uh, we could probably chart this out, don't you think? We could look at all the elements of the social safety net in Canada and the U.S. and, and um, you know, and sort of compare uh, them to other aspects of the economy. And at the end of the day, I think the U.S. would be in a, in a rapid decline. Um, you could say that, uh, you know, unemployment is down. You could say that wages are higher. Um, but there are other elements at play that distinguish the 99% from the 1%. And the 99% ain't doing so well. And the bottom of the 99% not doing well at all. And the threat of a Republican Congress will, will exacerbate that. So I think we've achieved this. Um, we have more disadvantaged, more people who are vulnerable, and we have a safety net that is um, you know, not stable, not predictable, or except on the way down, um, and, that, <laughs> and, that, and that may very well fold up under us. And I guess the question, and, and it all relates to the shows that you and I have done for homeless, because that, that's a metric, you know? If you're homeless, you're saying something about the society, about the economy. It's not taking care of you. And I'd like to add one more point before we go forward. You talked about cities. You talked about Vancouver. And indeed, you know, the homeless and, and the vulnerable are visible in the ghettos in those cities. We haven't talked about outside the cities. There are a lot of people in both countries. I, I couldn't speak much for Canada, but at least, at least in the U.S. who are really dirt poor. Uh, who who need the social safety net. They live in rural areas. They live essentially off the economic grid. Uh, and the government's not taking care of them either. And perhaps you could say they're the ones who don't realize what Trump and his friends are doing to them because they need more than a lot of people in the cities need. So uh, I think this phenomenon we're talking about applies both to cities and to rural areas in both countries. Do you agree? I agree, but one item you said, you know, just doesn't ring true. Uh, you mentioned Vancouver and you used the word ghetto. There are no ghettos whatsoever in most Canadian cities. There is certainly none in Vancouver. There are none in, you know, the second and third biggest cities in, in British Columbia or no other city that I've been in in, in British Columbia. The, some of the Indian reservations, you know, have some ghetto features to them, you know, but certainly uh, none of the major cities in Canada, you know, resemble, you know, uh, New York City where, you know, there genuinely are ghettos. Um, you know, I lived uh, when I went to university in the Bedford Stuyvesant area of of downtown Brooklyn. You know, and and you know, to me that if you describe a ghetto, I would describe that as a ghetto at that time. You know, and I visited Harlem in that era, and and it had a lot of ghetto features, and some of those big, uh, you know housing projects were not much better than ghettos, even though, you know, the buildings and the grounds were a little cleaner that still had that that feeling. Um, however, you know, the social safety net in Canada, Canadians are very proud of it, but, but it's just been um, odd economics, the way it's been managed. Uh, we, you know, about every eight or 10 years, we seem to change from a from a more liberal type government to a more conservative government, very similar to the US. Uh, you know, a president run, runs, when they win, they usually get a second term and then the public wants to go for the other party. Now, in our, you know, conservative side, which is like your Republicans, 
uh, not not as far to the uh, to the right as the American Republican, but um, you know they will have improvements to some social measures, you know, but generally favor. There should be less taxes total. There should be less government total. The very wealthy should be treated better than everybody else. Um, the, um, <clears throat> however, some of our conservative, you know, prime ministers have have passed things that have greatly improved the uh, uh, the social safety net in Canada. However. <clears throat> Uh, generally, they don't really, you know, equate how to improve economics. Like, there's nothing that could help a society better than, than, you know, raising all boats. You know, the the idea that uh, you know you need to increase the standard of living. Is what have the, what has Sweden or Finland or Denmark done or Norway, even though they get little. Uh, help from some, a lot of oil, um, what have they done where they have a better social safety net than, than any country in the world, countries in the world, you know, and yet, um, you know, they got uh, a higher standard of living than almost every country in the world, including Canada and the United States. And really, you know, they, you know, will have um, higher taxes for the very rich. You know, but they, they don't. So in Canada, you collect higher tax from everybody. Then you turn around and redistribute it to almost everybody. You know, well, that's just stupid. Right. It's true. I mean, you you can take a multimillionaire and, and he's getting uh, social security payments. Is that really necessary? Uh, why not distribute that to people who have greater need for it? Uh, Ken, I wanted to go through some of the social safety net components. Um, that I could think of, you know, one, um, and you mentioned some of these, is food stamps and food help, uh, you know, give away food. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, they used to give away huge amounts of American cheese, <laughs> American cheese, to all kinds of nonprofits, to poor people. It was a great big giveaway. Anyway, food stamps, food help, um, school lunches. Uh, we talked briefly about Social Security. To me, uh, the, the most uh, tragic thing is to see somebody who has worked all his life and gets in, into uh, his elder years or her elder years, doesn't have enough money to live. And if you take Social Security away or reduce it, you're really creating a national tragedy. Anyway, uh, Social Security is one thing. It's, it's a core point in the social safety net. Medicare and health, you talked about health in Canada, and I certainly agree that as far as disadvantaged people, um, Canada has a way better system. And talk about going through the tube, you know, so many inefficiencies and corruptions and, um, you know, bureaucracies that, that stop the efficiency of that, of, of all of this. You have unemployment insurance, which I would consider, you know, unemployment payments, which I would consider a uh, social safety net element, uh, although it differs from location to, to location, state to state, and sometimes it's um, better and sometimes it's worse, and sometimes it's much worse. You have welfare payments where you just write a check. I always liked uh, Andrew Yang, Yang, remember he ran for president? I always liked his uh, notion of guaranteed minimum income, and maybe, maybe that's what they do in some of those countries in Scandinavia, I don't know. Um, in any event, um, welfare payments, cash payments, and of course, there's housing that's really a big part of it because everywhere, you know, a percentage, a big percentage of whatever you have goes to housing. Did I miss anything? Is that the same in Canada? What's your reaction to those components? Well, most of the components are the same in Canada. We don't have food stamps at all. Um, you know, we have, you know, the family allowance payment or whatever is, is we have a more generous system than the U.S., but similar ideas. And one of the biggest problems which Canada has, and I think it's even worse than the U.S., is, is 
um, the jurisdiction, like what items are the responsibility of a province or in the U.S. a state compared to what's the federal? And we just have endless arguments between the federal government and the provinces over, you know, well, gee, we don't want to have this or that. For example, right now in Canada, you know, the federal government has caused a, an extreme problem in our housing crisis. You know, we if you think the U.S. has a shortage of housing, you know, Canada's way worse because uh, we adjusted the federal policies with regard to immigration and, you know, increased the population of Canada roughly 5% last year. You know, it's it just a ridiculous amount. Well, with two or three years worth of substantial increase in in immigration without, you know, anybody having much warning, you know, no municipality was expecting that as we now have a ridiculous housing crisis. So the federal government immediately, because they knew they were to blame for the housing crisis, the immigration, they decided, you know, well, they're going to have a budget uh, rate in the next day or so. And uh, and that uh, key in that was they have all kinds of announcements about how they're going to greatly improve the housing crisis. Well, one of their items was uh, was they were going to negotiate directly with the cities uh, in order that they could uh, make sure that they put carrots and sticks saying we will give you money if you allow, you know, four uh, units or a fourplex on a single family home lot or what was a single family home lot last week. If you'll change it to allow fourplex, we'll give you a bunch of money to build more housing, etc. Well, immediately, one of the provinces jumps up and down and, you know, says, uh, well, housing is, you know, you can't deal with the municipalities. They they are, they come under us and, and you can't have any contract with them. You've got to deal through us, you know, make a big stink. Well, it's hard to implement a good policy. You know, that Singapore has a great advantage over over Canada in the United States with one level of government able to deal with everything. You know, in, in our case, uh, you know, we're sitting with four or five levels. I mean, you, you know, you have normally you think of three levels. You have a municipal government, a provincial or state government, and a federal. Well, all of the cities now are, are multiple jurisdiction municipalities. So you have these metro governments well, then, you know, in Canada, we also have the the Indians or the natives, indigenous people, you know, some of their reservations are in the middle of cities, you know, like, like you know, particularly the ones in Western Canada, you know, parts of downtown Vancouver, you know, are right along, you know, the shore in, the, in West Vancouver, one of the upscale neighborhoods is the biggest shopping center in Vancouver's on Indian land, <laughs> um, you know, and, and they get... Well, it's revenue. the problem of a democracy, isn't it? Um, you know, we, we talk about the reason there are so many vulnerable people, and in fact, the reason there are so, there's such an increase in vulnerable people, and you have to lay that at the feet of the bureaucrats, because, you know, A, uh, the economy is dicey in terms of treating the vulnerable people, having a social safety net that actually encourages them to become wealthier, middle class, you know. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, government grows, and government as government grows, it becomes more bureaucratic. And as it becomes more bureaucratic, this goes back to a point I made earlier, it doesn't care. Um, not only, you know, the legislators who adopt or don't adopt social safety net programs, uh, it's the, the bureaucrats. Um, it's that huge bureaucracy where they have, you know, lost their lost their uh, concern for for the uh, people they're supposed to be uh, helping. The other thing I wanted to mention is there are some oblique um, elements of the social safety net. One that comes to mind and is called the Legal Aid Society, 
uh, here in Hawaii. I, it's probably got different names in different states. But the idea is you get free legal uh, assistance. And, and that usually translates into you know, helping you if you have some kind of domestic issue, but more importantly, helping you if you have gone crosswise with people who scam you. And so I think vulnerable people get scammed more often because they're not educated about it. They get scammed, they need legal help, or they will wind up bankrupt. Um, and, and I think that's kind of a, a component of the uh, social safety net. One other element that I want to mention is, um, is providing free or cheap internet service, you know, internet provider service around the community. Because there is a digital divide. Um, and vulnerable people, you know, don't have um, the kind of access to the internet they should have in order to learn, in order to stay current with events, in order to become more responsible members of the electorate and the community, um, you know, and to participate and contribute to the community. If they don't have um, a sort of egalitarian access to internet, they're in trouble. And, and that is so in this country, for sure. There are some areas which are getting internet. There are other areas which are not. Um, and I think those two things are oblique, you know, Ken, but I think they're, they're, kind of, they're, they're kind of connected with the social safety net because they help people who are vulnerable. What do you think? I agree with you exactly. Uh, Canada handles uh, a lot of those things differently than the U.S. does. Um, you know, in Canada, you know, using the Internet concept, the Canadian government feels that they the right approach is to severely restrict the competition in order that those providers that have quasi-monopolies, uh, you know, or oligopoly, um, that they will provide the service in remote areas that if it was purely, you know, a for-profit only tough competition, they would not provide, you know, internet services to remote areas. So, you know, the costs of a lot of things in Canada are higher solely because that is kind of a government attitude and and you have these corporations that just get a free ride because they got kind of a monopoly and they become less efficient than the civil service. <laughs> no, but nevertheless, they, you know, chug along. Well, from the top down, there's also an issue of trust busting. Um, you know, I, I think back when, when Teddy Roosevelt was chasing big trusts around and trying to make that more, more egalitarian for, you know, the common folk, uh, he had some success and it was well motivated. But I don't, I don't think we're doing that much regulation. Um, I don't think we're, you know, we're doing that much trust busting. And when you look, uh, for example, at Amazon, that's, uh, you know, providing huge percentage of the consumer goods that we need and buy, um, you know, you get worried that they have tremendous, almost monopolistic control over some areas of the marketplace. And that does not work well for vulnerable people who may not have access to those goods elsewhere. And so I think uh, this is a sort of a tertiary element of the social safety net. But you really have to make sure that American business uh, is is not taking advantage of the, of the 99 percent. Your thoughts? As a generalization, business is more efficient than government. You know, there are not too many cases where you can, you know, prove otherwise. Uh, and in Canada, you know, the federal government in particular, you know, just whenever it's a liberal government, you know, which is like Democrat in the U.S., you know, the civil service expands phenomenally, you know, because they tend to think that they can do a better job than everybody else, which is just not correct. Uh, you know, underlying everything is, is what are you doing with the economy so everybody's standard of living is better tomorrow than it is today? You know, and, and in Canada, the social safety net in a lot of ways has gotten the way of that objective. You know, that things have been shoved in place 
you know, and simply disrupted economic efficiency. You know, the, the Canadian government, you know, right now is just implementing a major expansion to our national Medicare program by adding, you know, pretty complete dental coverage. You know, well, that's a pretty big item. It's basically everybody in the country gets free dental. You know, you collect a lot of money and put it in the civil service, run it around a few times and have less money come out. You know, and that doesn't really make the economy more efficient. And 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 yet the, you know, Medicare system in Canada has got a bunch of problems already. So by adding the dental simply has, you know, decreased the quality of the social safety net. In, in the medical side, uh, you'll have um, somebody with a lot of money, uh, you know, you can get a hip replacement or a knee replacement in Canada for nothing. You know, that's totally free. Well, if you've got enough money, you don't want to wait, you know, three months or six months to get your your knee replacement. So you pay money and go to the Mayo Clinic in, in the United States or some nearby, you know, good, good hospital in the U.S. and you can pay for the treatment, you know, and, and everybody, you know, describes what a ridiculous amount that operation cost in the U.S., you know, but nevertheless, uh, you know, the, the, you know, waiting list gets longer if you add more bells and whistles to the, to the existing medical program. You know, one of the fundamental lessons, I think, of this conversation is that if you had uh, an efficient economy, you wouldn't have as many people on the street. You wouldn't have as many vulnerable, disadvantaged people who need a social safety net. Um, they would manage, um, you know, by themselves in a, in a more free market, I think. Um, and and the and the econ the economy in general, if it's better, as you say, all the boats rise, as in Norway, whether it's oil or otherwise. But you know, the problem in a democracy. See if you agree, because you've been thinking about this since I first met you. <laughs> Um, the problem in a democracy is that, so the bridge fails in Maryland. Okay, now we're in for a billion over there. Um, and then some other political thing happens, and for, we're in for billions over there. Um, and of course, uh, this in, also involves um, foreign wars. And the military gets almost a trillion dollars a year from the government. And it's not, it's not planned, you know, it's almost like every year, you see what's on the front page, and that defines, um, you know, how we are spending the money that we don't have. Uh, and I, I find it, I find that suggests to me that it, it's not efficient, it's not planning, it's political, it's propaganda, it's mm, mm, notion of the moment, uh, rather than good economic planning. And of course. If you have good economic planners in the government appointed and, you know, with good resumes and, you know, expertise, they come and go. And when that administration changes, bingo, you got new guys who may not agree. Um, so I don't know if there's a kind of consistency that we need in, in order to do long range economic planning and fiscal planning, um, free of politics, that will allow the government to create an efficient economy and thus raise all the boats. Your thoughts on that one? I agree with you quite fully. A, a good example of, of how government can screw something up, you know, to a great extent intentionally because of the short-term thinking and politics. You know, in Canada, we had, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you know, a pretty attractive... Uh, package for uh, retirees. You know, we have a, you know, one of the key things in Canada's social safety net is a, is a federal um, Canada pension plan. You know, like everybody with a job of any sort in Canada must contribute towards this pension plan. And so when you change jobs, you don't lose your pension. When you're unemployed for a little while, you don't lose 
pension you've had and and you know it is similar to most corporate pensions it's not any worse not any better however you know when you think of uh, you know when you and i were uh, were young and and working our way through high, you know at some part-time job while we're in high school you know i was getting 65 cents an hour for pay well you know, when the government intentionally has a target for inflation of 2%. Now, more often than not, it goes above that. That is, we've never had a deflation in Canada or the United States, but we've had lots of inflation times when inflation has been well over, you know, 4%, let's say, you know, just recently, but, but particularly in uh, you know the late 1970s you know you had you know way above 10 percent um well when you had this canned pension you know well there was an idea of you but well maybe we should index the pension well if you're say well we're only going to increase the pension if the inflation's above three percent you know, well, all you're doing is saying absolutely everybody that when they retire, they're getting gypped. Well, that's a, an example of bad policy, badly implemented. Um, but let me let me go back. We're almost out of time here. Let me go back and refer to something that happened in January of 2017. First thing that Trump did uh, when he got into office that time was um, he pushed, and I mean really heavily pushed, a tax quote reform bill, and it passed. It passed without congressional hearings, without thoughtful deliberation. It passed on a completely political basis, and it served the 1% and not the 99%. And the 1% had you know, long, long shadow kinds of benefits that would save them lots of tax money for years and years and years. And the benefits, to the extent there were benefits, for the 99% um, were short-lived. And so what happened is the government lost a lot of tax money for a group that really mm, didn't need this kind of reform. Um, and it gained tax money, uh, ultimately, from the group that did need this kind of reform. It was upside down. And if he gets into office, he will do the same thing again. It's euphemistic tax reform. That's not tax reform. That's the upside down of tax reform. So I'm, I'm only saying this because what it means is there's more money for the rich guys, less money for the poor guys, and less money for the social safety net. So this has to impact that. It has to impact the social safety net. Our economic and fiscal policy has been increasingly upside down. Joe, Joe Biden tried to change that, um, but if Trump gets back into office, we'll see it in, in technicolor. I agree with you, and you know, to add a point to it, uh, just after World War II, you know, in the 50s and early 60s, in a lot of ways, was the, was the uh, you know, the most democratic, fair, you know, social, safety net ideas uh, that existed because during the war, you know, the very wealthy were used to paying more than 75% tax rates and, and that government was involved in all kinds of things. And that, you know, that was whittled away and, and government was more efficient back then. Um, and, you know, there was not, um, you know, professional politicians that had never had a job before. You know, just you know, when they're thirty years old, they move into into Parliament and, or into Congress, and they've never had real jobs. They don't have real world experience. Yeah, well, there's lots of lots of material here to consider, um, including tax policy in general. But we now we got to go. Thank you, Ken, Dr. Ken Rogers, retired Canadian businessman in Kelowna, British Columbia helping us understand the differences between the North and the South. Thank you so much. Aloha from Canada. <laughs> uh, aloha.
Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.